Halo. <coughs> okay, so I haven't done any work on this since we left off before because uh, I was too tired. Uh, that is okay. Um, where we left off was we had just created the infrastructure to import uh, complex analytic functions into our wider context. Um, there's a couple things I think I want to clear up about. So we also did this one, this little interesting thing. There's a couple things I want to clean up about this one. Uh, some things that could be more clear. Um, so I'm going to add, we're going to add another um, a theorem here. So <clears throat> I just wanted to add a little piece of uh, dialogue after this result, uh, which is that uh, in the future, uh, whenever we refer to a complex analytic function uh, over some, I want to say some complex domain, um, this will be implicitly understood as being extended um, in the manner of this theorem to the pre-projection of its domain. Um, so for example, the complex analytic functions um, exponential assigned cousin can all be uh, unambiguously extended to all of A. Um, we had already stated that. Um, Also extend the complex logarithms when we extend the branch cut. Um, so, for example, um, let's see.
Let's leave the rest of this dialogue for later. I'm gonna fix this up. Okay, so I wanna have uh, a serum here. So, a couple of serums actually. Um, <clears throat> so, one of the theorems we want is um, if we have. Um, If we have a um, complex analytic function on a domain, okay, right, 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 okay. I, I, I figured out what I want to say. Okay, so, so it's this. So let f map s to a uh, b complex analytic, then for any x in Uh, for any x and s, we have p1 of f of x is equal to f of p1 of x. <coughs> so this is, this is the first interesting proof that we have about complex analytic functions that are extended uh, into this um, Let me rewrite this a little bit. Actually, let's just do composition notation. P1 compose F is F compose P1. Because that's a little more concise. Um, yeah, so this, this first sort of result we have is that if we have a complex analytic function, it permutes with this P1 projection um, as, as in terms of um, composition. Um, that's sort of interesting, but it actually follows us pretty quickly from the Taylor series definition. So, sorry, this follows from the fact that P1 is a uh, continuous, actually you can see P1, which maps A to C is a continuous uh, homomorphism. Uh, it's a linear uh, and <clears throat> we can actually just make that um, actually does this follow I think this might follow more generally actually. Let's do, I think I think this is always true. No, it has to be mixed in the domain. Uh, I'll just I'll just do this. Uh, okay. Continuous, linear, and multiplicative. Um, so then the proof is so we say uh, we want a Taylor series first. Uh, oh wait, I'm a, I'm a silly goose. It should be a line. Um, so the proof for this is um, we have f of um, f of x is the sum n equals zero to infinity. It's just the Taylor series again. We have the nth derivative at p1 of x divided by n factorial times x minus p1 of x. Uh, let me make sure I wrote that all correctly. Um, that looks good except for the fact that I messed up the environment. Okay, I think that's correct. Looks nice. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> okay, so we use the linearity and continuity to pull it through the sum. Um, actually, we want, we want a little more. Um, okay, so we have f of x is this. Actually, p1 of f of x, we'll just do this for now. So this, we pull it in through this. Uh, I lost the exponent on 
on this linear term. This should be power n. That's better. Um, and then we want to note, um, actually we say uh, since f is complex analytic, then every uh, for each x in s and every n we have the nth derivative which we have p1 of x is in c and the nth derivative f nth derivative p1 of x is in complex so that's a complex number um, <clears throat> uh, it didn't like what happened that's why okay yeah so f is complex and linear each x and s we had and every n or sorry we have let me rephrase that so for each um, x in s we have uh, p1 of x is complex and the nth derivative uh, and the answer of yes, he is complex. So it can be factored out of P1 as follows. So we have P1 f of x is P1 of this whole sum, which is the sum of the P1. Uh, and then we have, so we have this new line, and so we will use the multiplicative properties. So we have, so first of all, it's linear, so it passes right through uh, that whole first term. And then it also, we can pull out this power n. Let's see how that looks. Okay, looks good. Uh, but then actually p1 of x minus p1 of x um, that's just p1 of x minus p1 of p1 of x um, that's actually just just itself uh, that's just zero um, and then this lets us reduce down we only get the term where n is zero so we be zero derivative which is just f uh, of p1 of x divided by 0 factorial, which is f of p1 of x. And I think that's all we need. Uh, and then I just have to clean up the way this is formatted, because there's a lot going on. Um, so let's do, I'll add some space, uh, let's add a, some alignment tabs there and there. Uh, and then we'll definitely need there. That seems good, I think. But yeah, looks nice. Um, yes, complex analytic, p1 of f uh, is f of p1. Um, so that that is just, just what that is, p1 of f is f of p1. Um, so that's kind of nice. Uh, so that essentially it's telling us that uh, when we evaluate a complex analytic function on some point, whatever its first index is actually doesn't care what, what all the other ones are. It only cares what x is on the first index, um, which is kind of interesting. Um, there's actually a lot more you can do with this sort of idea. In general, if you have a complex analytic function, uh, the uh, or actually any analytic function, technically, um, it's a its value on, say, the kth projection um, is invariant on all of the uh, the projections of the input, which are not divisors of that, uh, the, the index that you're taking the projection of. Um, there's not a concise way to state that here, and it's also not super useful, so I'm not going to put it in. Um, but this one is useful. This one in particular is useful. The P1 projection, is, it tends to be very useful. Um, Yes. So this is this. Um, we can also do something else. So um, we can say 
Um, let's see. What else, what else did we want to do? I think that might actually be enough for this whole theorem. That we, this whole example we had done. Um, we could try... Um, so down here, here, right here, uh, we did this sort of technique to show that if we have this uh, exp of s plus z, this is also this is always equal to this this product rule. The way that we did that is essentially we consider both of these. If we fix one variable, um, then we can treat the other variable as being uh, as being the free variable. And for each, so we basically did um, each. This is a, a complex analytic in terms of s if z is fixed, or z if s is fixed. So if we leave z fixed in complex. Um, this is analytic in terms of s, so it has to be this identity is true for all s in its domain, which is everything. Um, but then this identity is true for all s and a, and for all z and c. So we just take any, and now we uh, sort of change the variables around, leave s and a fixed. Uh, this is now analytic in terms of z, so nothing has changed. It's still analytic. Um, it's true for all z in terms of the variable z, all z on the complex plane. Um, so it has to be true for all z in, um, in in the whole space A. So it's true for all s and A and for all z and A, which is just all pairs s and z. Um, this basic proof format of kind of jumping between the variables and doing this identity theorem uh, to ex extend the definitions um, or the properties, um, this can be generalized. So it doesn't have to just be the exponential function. Um, we could probably extend it to um, let's see, independent domains. So, we'll, so we can say, um, so we can generalize that theorem uh, if we would like. So we can say, um, that's not what I wanted. There we go. Um, so I'm not sure how I want to state this exactly. Something along the lines of, um, let f of, we'll say s1, and we'll just give it some n variables, uh, be um, analytic. Actually, we'll say f and g. So we'll say take n in a natural number and let f. So we'll actually say let f and g map cn, actually not cn, we'll do an, to a, that's not what we want either. Um, okay, pick n in natural, let um, s1, how do I want to say this? Um, we want them to, to work on, on lots of different domains. Um, so we can say, uh, so we do want some, some functions of, of multiple variables, um, but we don't want them, we don't want the domain to be too restricted. Um, so what we can maybe say is, um, we can say, Well, we could just we could just make this unique to 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 complex analytic functions. Actually, um, we could we could just say that um, we'll just we'll just do the two case and we'll we'll leave we'll leave the other cases to other things. So we'll say uh, let f and g be actually we'll say map c uh, two to a actually not c two. Um, S times we'll do S one times S two. Okay, S one, S two, subset two. Um, F A be such that I kind of want to phrase this. Let F and G map these to these be such that for each fixed S. The functions f of s z and 
g of s z actually say f of s z f of z s g of s z and g of z s are complex uh, anal um, analytic and it, there is a limit point we can say This is really hard to phrase. This is really hard to phrase. Maybe I just won't do this. <laughs> this is very difficult to phrase, actually. It's, it's extremely difficult to phrase, so I'm just not going to do it. Um, okay, there's uh, two we's there. Okay. We'll leave that alone. Yeah, if it's too hard to say, just don't say it. <laughs> uh, yeah. Oh, it's thundering outside. Uh, well, if the stream suddenly stops at some point, that's why. Hopefully it doesn't, but uh, just in case. Okay, um, okay, so, um, so blah, 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 so we have this permutation property, that's nice. Um, for the next theorem, we extend the part and measure part operators, so we pointwise, uh, so that for any x and a index k in natural, um, Actually, let's we could write this here. period at the end of the sentence and that's good uh, okay so this is fine okay for the next term we extend the real part measure part operators to be blah 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 um we'll make sure they blah, blah, blah. okay so um uh, let log be any function we can say any We could add a lemma here, actually. Let's add a lemma. So we can say, um, let uh, log map s uh, to a b um, Oh, let's do it this way. Okay, so um, suppose 
xp x equals xp y then um, x minus y is in uh, i2 pi times z Yeah, so this is um, this is sort of a natural um, theorem of complex analysis um, that x x minus y is in is uh, an integer multiple of pi that if if two uh, exponentials agree, um, we will use this to say um, that. Um, Yeah. Okay. 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 Yeah. So we're we're gonna use this to say um, we're gonna edit this this theorem a little bit so that this this logarithm is unambiguous. I guess um, we could add another lemma, but but I'll leave that there for now. Um, okay. So suppose x p y x equals x p y then x minus y is this. Okay. So the way that we do that is um, the way that we prove that is we'll say um uh we'll say um uh since um uh since exp p1 oh, actually we can say since p1 of uh exp y is equal to exp p1 of y which is in c star uh, or we can just be more explicit, not be equal to zero. Uh, then uh, x p y is in a star. Um, actually, let's be even more explicit. So first, uh, we can say uh, we have. Uh, exp y and exp minus y. Actually, let's just use x's for now. Equals uh, as analytic on all of x in a, um, and we have the product exp x, exp minus x is equal to exp. Um, no, I don't want to do this. Um, you what x and you see why. Let's do let's just do the product rule first. Okay, x times y as analytic for all analytic for all x in a with fixed y. Um, let's say and. Um, for all x, y, in c, we have, uh, maybe I want to do this in more parts. Um, my, my keyboard is freaking out. Okay. I want to do... Um, a theorem like this, and I also want to do this 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 product rule for exponents. I'm just trying to figure out. Okay, let's just do that directly. For all x, y, and a, we have um, x, p, x, x, p, y is x, p, x plus y, and x, p, x equals 1 if and only if, and we can just say only if. X is in I two pi z. Um, that actually shoves everything we want to say in one in one place.
Hmm. This really doesn't want to go on one line, so I guess it just won't. I like to be compact, but sometimes it doesn't work. Actually, I guess we'll just separate these out. Whatever. Okay, so we say um, theorem applies for all x, y complex numbers if we fix y as constant and both are xp x, xp y, and xp x plus y are analytic for all x in a. So by identity theorem, they must be identical. Similarly, if we fix x in a b theorem applies for all y in c, and again both are both functions are analytic for all y in a, so by identity theorem we have. Um, they must be identical for all y in a. And that's pretty much that proof. Okay, that's fine. That's not what I wanted. Are we going to prove this? Um, so let's see. So we have um, if it's not okay. Yeah. Okay. I got it. Okay. So since uh, P1 of XPX, which is just, um, since 1 is P1 of EXPX, which is EXP of P1, 
of x, then p1 of x is in i2 pi z. This is just a complex analysis theorem. Um, so since one is, so since we have, so by premise, um, so exp of x, this is just one. So this one is p1 of expx. Uh, exp is complex analytics, so you can permute p1 um, to pull that in. But now p1 of x is, is complex. Um, and so it has to be, it has to satisfy this, this result. Um, from complex analysis. Uh, from this, so if we have um, Let me do a think. Um, I want to try to apply the logarithm. That's actually what I want to do. Um, Let's do it this way. Um, restrict um, x to be such that, uh, or we'll, we'll say, take the case where p1 of x is 0. Um, then we can say, actually we'll do it this way, um, uh, for all um, for all x in um, c such that um, the imaginary part of x is in minus pi to pi exclusive. We have uh, exp of x. We have this. Um, we can say um, is in C without this interval. Okay, so we'll say um, um, okay, so we have blah blah, so we have this P1 of X being this. And then we can say uh, since uh, P1 of X is in C, yes. Notice that for all X and C, uh, having, let's specify that. Let's do z. Uh, use a different variable. For all z complex numbers, having the imaginary part between minus pi and pi, we have exp of z being in this set uh, over which log is analytic. And we have log of exp z equaling z. Um, since log is um, since log is analytic on the p one inverse. Projection. This applies 
uh, this is still true for all uh, z in a having um, this is still true for all z and a having um, having uh, the p1 of, and the imaginary part of p1 of z in minus pi to pi. Um, so essentially we're saying, um, so we're saying uh, because this p1 permutes with the exponential function, um, then we get this first index for free. So the first projection of x has to be some i2 pi times some integer. Um, and then, uh, then we can say, uh, well, if we just look at complex numbers z, if they have the imaginary part in minus pi to pi, um, exclusive, um, then the, the exponential of z is in this, is not, it has a, uh, non, it's not on the negative axis, um, but the logarithm, the principal logarithm function that we selected is analytic, uh, on that set. Um, and the log of exp of z is just a z. Uh, since the log is analytic on the p1 inverse pre-projection, um, this is still true for all z and a having the imaginary part of the projection of z in here. Um, so, in particular, if uh, p1 of x is 0, then log exp x is, the, is just x. Um, but that's also we could say x is a log of e of g of x, which is also log one, which is zero. So x is zero. Then we can say otherwise, uh, we, have, we can find n in z so that p1, uh, actually we'll just do it this way. Otherwise, we have um, exp of x times exp of negative p1 of x. This is this is just still one. One is this times that, which is exp um, x minus p1 of x, so that the log of x minus p1 of x equals, sorry, the log of exp, x minus p1 of x. So that p1, yes, p1 of x minus p1 of x is just zero and the log of the exponential of that is x minus p1 of x. Um, or we could rearrange this. x minus p1 of x is this log, which is um, uh, log one, which is zero. Thus, uh, x equals p1 of x, which is in i2 pi. And some integers. Let's see how that looks. Okay, so uh, since one is the is p one of, of exp x, which is also um, um, p one of exp, which is exp of p one, then uh, p one of x is just i two pi z. So since p one is uh, a complex number, um, we have. Yes, then we have, this has to have this, this property. Um, we could rearrange this also. We could say, um, since P1 of X is complex, and also uh, exponent of P1 is p1 of this exponent, which is 1. Then p1 of x is in i2 by z. 
Um, notice that for all Z and complex, I mean, blah, blah, we have exp z is in the set where log is analytic and log of exp z is z. Since log is analytic on the P1 inverse pre projection, this is still true for all Z and A having this. So, in particular, if P1x is 0, um, then um, we have uh, x is the log of the XPX, which is log 1, which is 0. Um, otherwise, we have 1 as equaling. Um, exp(x) times exp minus p1x, which is exp(x) minus p1 of x, um, so that this thing um, is uh, zero. Okay, that seems okay. This is not going to work. Okay, nice. And that's it. Okay, that's nice. So essentially, the the way that this goes is we say um, using this P1 pure reading with exponential property, um, we can prove that the P1 of x is in this is in the set um, just from the properties on complex numbers, uh, and then we can use um, this property, this additive property of exponential, the multiplicative and additive property of exponential, to show that um, that if we um, actually, we, we use so that we get the first projection. Then we say, oh, hey, log is analytic on the P1 inverse pre projection. And essentially, what this boils down to is uh, if P1 of z is 0, then z is the log of exp(z). And then we just use this, this addition sum uh, product thing property to say, well, you know, hey, both of these are 1, so they multiply up to 1, but this, this is just the exp of x minus P1 of x. But x minus p1 of x, we've just subtracted off the first projection. This is so. This is just zero. Um, this first, on the first projection, because we just subtracted off the first component. Um, so then, um, if we just let z be this x minus p1 of x, this is the log of exp of x uh, minus p1 of x. Uh, but we already know that the exp of x minus p1 of x right here that's one. Um, so this thing is just log of one which is 0, uh, and therefore x is equal to p1 of x. But we already found out p1 of x is in i2 pi z, and we're done. That's it. Um, so that's kind of interesting. Um, so we have, so recap, if x is any point in our whole entire space, 
and its exponential is 1, um, then in fact x is uh, not only a complex number, uh, it's actually an imaginary number, it's on the imaginary axis, and it's an integer multiple of i2 pi. Um, so even with this whole infinite space of all these other dimensions, uh, we still get this property. These are the only ones that we get. Um, you, can do a, you can do a similar technique. Um, you can do a similar technique, uh, technique with sines and cosines, actually, to find their zeros. It's very similar. Um, you, might, you might actually probably want to do an easier method than this, <laughs> to be completely honest. Um, yeah. Um, but yeah, so, okay. Um, so that's that. So we have this addition property, we have this thing. Um, and that, that will help us do this. Let's add a corollary to this. Uh, if we have if x and y in, I like easier, yeah, in a have um, exp x equals exp y, then x minus y, or we can say then there is n in z with x equals y plus i2 pi n. Okay, um, so this is just a quick corollary. So the way this goes is we say, um, you know, we say um, uh, exponential x um, times xp minus y. Actually, we'll say this is um, oh, what do I want to say? Um, Let's just do division, divide by axpy. You say one is this. Okay, so actually let's be more explicit. Um, the identity exp minus x equals one over exp x. Actually, we can just say it that way. Um, notice um, exp. Oh gosh, it's, let me type, there we go, xpx times exp minus, uh, minus x equals xp x minus x, which is 1, I can just say 0, which is 1, um, so xp minus x is xpx. The minus one. So we can say um, one is this fraction, which is exp x exp minus y, which is exp x minus y, which um, implies x minus y is in i2 pi z. Let's see how that looks formatted. I'm just doing this a little more, I think, explicit. We're, we're being explicit about the integer. Um, the rest is the same.
Okay, there we go. Um, so there's our integer multiple, so blah, blah, blah. Um, right, so then we have, so we do one is xpx over xpy. We do this as a fraction if we want. x over y, which is exp x times exp negative y, uh, and then we have this difference, um, and then we can say So, um, so just from this one, so this one gives us our integer of x is i2 by n. Um, and then from this corollary, we just use this property. Um, uh, then we just do, well, if, if expx and expy, if these are the same, um, then we can, we can divide them to get one. Um, but then this is just this, so this, this denominator just turns into exp of negative y. Uh, we use the the um, the product rule for exponents to get exp x minus y. Well, if we have this thing, this exp of this thing equaling one, um, then the above gives um, we have n in um, integer, some integer n with x minus y is just an integer multiple of i two pi. Uh, but then we just solve for x. X is y plus i two pi n. Um, so we can say um, actually. Um, yes, so actually this is, this is nice, um, let's pull off this text here and put it down here, I think. So, um, we have, for the next theorem, we extend the required metric operators to be pointwise for any x and a. In x and uh, k, we have this projection. Okay, so we can say, um, we would probably add something else here. Um, we could probably add, um, we could probably add that, <coughs> uh, for any, uh, for any output, because the exp is, uh, surjective onto A star, that might help, uh, actually, um, that could be interesting. Yeah, okay. Let's do that. Maybe. What did we say? So, um, up here, we have, in this theorem here, we noted log is analog on the P1, inverse pre-projection, blah, blah, blah. Uh, log of exp is z. That's what we had. Um,
Okay, yeah, let's try that. Okay, so we have um, um, we have um, for all uh, x in we have um, p1 inverse of c set minus the interval minus infinity to zero inclusive. We have um, exp of log of x as we say across across x in this set. We have this as analytic and um, equaling x for x in c. Uh, so um, okay, we can say it, let's do it this way. We'll grab this. So we'll just say for x in this complex domain, we have, oh gosh. We have this equaling that. So x in c without this negative, uh, right, the non uh, negative real axis, we have if we log x equals x, but both are analytic over x in this whole pre projection. So by identity theorem x equals xp log x for any x in a with p1 of x is not in this interval. Then we can say similarly, we have log of x minus, uh, actually just negative x uh, plus i pi is um, we have exp of uh, log x uh, plus i pi. This is exp of log of minus x um, plus exp of i pi, sorry, times exp of i pi, which is negative of negative x, which is x. And we'll say similarly for uh, x um, for p1 of x not in, instead of uh, minus infinity to zero, will be in zero to positive infinity. And then we just um, take log of negative x. Similarly, so this, this, and then we have exp log minus x plus i pi is this, which is negative negative x, which is x, or we could say uh, negative x times negative one, which is x. So we have from this, we have um, exp of a as, or we can say a star is a subset of the image since p1 of exp of x is equal to exp of p1 of x which is non-zero we have also the other way around
Okay, let's see how that looks all written out. Um, yes, so crossed, um, if we have x as a complex number not on this negative axis, then uh, exp of log x is x. Both are analytic over x in this pre-projection. Um, so by identity theorem, so we can say, This is that, which is that. like how this is getting cut off under the other page. Uh, I don't know how to make it any better though. Uh, maybe I could just shove the entire theorem down. You can try to find a way to do that. Okay, so um, it's gonna look like they have this permutation property. Uh, we have this, we have this, okay. Uh, maybe I'll just, I'll just give it some space. That's probably fine. Here. Doesn't want to do that. Okay. Um, so you have the image. So ESP of A is A star. So what we want to say is this image is exactly the A star, the set of units. Um, and then the way that we do that is we say, um, well, uh, if we have uh, the first index, essentially, so from identity theorem, so this is true in general when defined. This is always true when defined on the complex plane. Um, but both of these are complex analytic. Um, so by identity theorem, we just get this identity is true for all, um, for all x in this pre-projected domain. And then we can say, well, instead of doing this, this domain, um, let's instead do, we'll just mirror it. We'll just, we'll just flip it around and we'll do log of negative x and we'll also add i pi. Um, so this is, is we get this, we just separate them out from the, the product rule, um, and the negatives cancel out, we just get x. Uh, so from this we have a star subset to um, exp of the image, exp of a. Uh, but since p1 of exp x is exp of p1 of x, which is non-zero, also a star is a superset of the image, uh, giving equality of sets. And that is that proof. Um, okay, so so now we can say um, in this in this theorem that we had done, this was the last one that we had done that we had worked on. So we're going to rephrase this a little bit. So we'll say. Um, let x be in um, a star, I think. Yeah, x is an a star, and um, log of x satisfy um, the xp of log of x is x. Then And then we have this 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 result. Okay. Um, so actually, we can ignore um, this first part now. So 
is that same dolan. Uh, so then this proof follows by separating the real imaginary parts, we have x is exp log x, which is exp time uh, of the real part of log x plus the i times the imaginary part of log x. Um, then we can say, um, notice that for each uh, s, z in complex numbers, we have exp uh, s plus z, yes, s plus z is exp s times exp z. We've already done this, um, so we actually can just jump straight to this other line. And let's put this in alignment. Let's align these. I think it's probably fine. Okay. Um, let's actually we'll we'll give it some space. I don't want them to be cramped. Okay. Uh, from Euler's formula, we have x p i z equals. Uh, that doesn't look good at all. Uh, from Euler's formula, we have x p i z equals cosine z plus i sine z, or an easy, um, but then we can say, but since these are analytic, it follows from identity theorem for all z in a, so So then we can have this, so we just separate this out. Um, and then we can say, um, so we can separate, actually, we can just do the distributive law here. I think. Yeah, we do want to do the distributive law. Okay. Um, why is it doing this? That I don't like that. Oh, okay, I know why. Because I never formatted this. Okay. Um, Since the Taylor series for exp for all of exp cosine sine at zero have all real coefficients and a sub ring is a topological but sub ring since these real parts and these imaginary part Actually, we can say since the real part and the measuring part of log x is an asymmetry, then also so we're saying uh, the Taylor series for uh, exponential sine and cosine at zero have all real coefficients. So since um, this um, real uh, function space, it's a bar is topologically closed and a subring. Um, and all of these components, so this this real part of log x and the imaginary part of log x, these are also real on each projection, then what we're essentially saying is um, that um, this this whole component here is purely uh, is purely real on each projection. Likewise with this whole one here. Uh, so both of these are, are purely real. Um, so the real part of x is this whole expression here, and the imaginary part is this whole expression here. That's just this part. Um, and then if we just square these and add them up, then we get this whole mess. Um, especially if we just factor them through as well. 
and then we say, well, since we have sine squared uh, plus cosine squared, this is 1. And I never do this convention, so I don't know why I did it here. Since we have sine squared, uh, cosine squared plus sine squared equals 1 for all z in real. Since these are analytic, this applies for all uh, z in our entire space. So we uh, have this whole expression. So uh, th these terms cancel out as just being one. And then we just get the sum of squares is this exponential term. And then we can say, well, finally, um, since we have this equals z as being, uh, the square root of z squared is z for all, um, actually, let's do this on a little bit more explicitly. Uh, we can say since uh, p1 of, uh, since four, uh, p1 of um, p1 of z uh, having uh, what are we going to say? Uh, actually, I'm going to say the imaginary part. Uh, no, the real part. The real part of p1 of z as being uh, greater than zero. The square root of z squared is z. I actually want to say um, um, z squared the part of z greater than zero. Actually, let's say it this way: z in complex with real part of z greater than zero. Uh, we have z squared having uh, being not in the negative real axis. So square root of z squared equals z uh, and also square root of z squared is z being analytic. So then um, this applies for any this applies for any C in A with uh, the real part of P1 being positive and since uh, Actually, we don't know that this is true. Um, and this is the last piece that we want. Um, P1 of the real part of exp over the real part of log bar. Um, this is, we're saying, we're asserting that this is a positive. We actually don't know that. Um, actually, what we want is, no, actually, this is fine. We don't, we don't need this uh, at all. Actually, we only need it for this part on the right side, or on the left side, rather. No, we do need that. I'm a silly goose. Okay, let's try that again. Let me... Okay, so what we want to say... Um, Oh, 
okay, of course. Um, okay, all we need to do, actually, we just need to verify that this is this is positive on the first on the first projection. All this other stuff doesn't matter. Um, um, We can say, um, uh, what do we want? Uh, if we apply uh, the real part of P1, I think, um, real part of P1 of all this junk is Just pull in this P1. Which is strictly positive. Actually, it's uh, we don't even need the real part. Um, we can just say P1. P1 of this exponential is the exponential of this P1, but then this is just real part on the inside. So then this is just the exponential of some real thing. in this range we have square z squared equaling z being analytic so of course applies for um, z in a which uh, having actually say a having yeah p1 of c Okay, there we go. I think that works. Um, This seems to check out. Um, yes, so this this is a little better. Uh, it's also a little bit faster, and we have uh, some other sort of corollary ideas here, uh, which is kind of nice. Um, okay. 
Okay. Um, so that's that's kind of cool. Um, let's do another little um, exercise. So. So these are all very nice. So let's do this. Um, um, let's define uh, some some other uh, complex exponentials. Um, okay, so for any for any S, Z, and A with um, S, uh, actually we can say for any Z and A and, no, I'll do it this way, S and A and Z and A star, we define the exponent, actually let's do, let's do another result here. Um, for any x, uh, yeah, x and a star, we have um, xp, uh, actually any x and a star, and n in uh, integers xp of n times the log of x, actually not just an a star, it'll have to be in um, this special set, so um, a with uh, p1 of x not in This negative real axis. So we want to prove that the exp of n times log of x is x power n. Um, actually, this is going to be super easy. Um, it, it's pretty much an immediate consequence of identity theorem. Um, um, note that we have exp n log x. We have both this and x power n are analytic in the specified domain. Um, and the identity holds for all x and c. When also x is in c. We say okay. Okay, nice. Um, so in that, in, actually, in that case, let's let's. Um, Let's do something a little different. Let's say um, for any s in a and z in this set, we define the exponent um,
Oh, I messed this up, actually. I was going to use a general branch of log, but I didn't do that. Yeah, let's fix this. I, I was going to use this lowercase log. Okay. I wonder if this is a special function label. Probably not. Good old power function. Okay. It's taking a second to compile. I probably should have tested this before just... Oh, and that's probably why. That's funny. Okay. I broke it. This should work. I accidentally made it go on an infinite loop, <laughs> which is very funny. Okay. I wonder if I really want to do this. Let me think. Actually, let's just do, um, let's just do this.
Guess not. Okay, that's better. I've made this a little more general. Uh, we've left the log function as ambiguous. Actually, technically, um, we're not even using this lowercase log as a function. We're just using it as a symbol, which is kind of funny. Uh, we're just saying some log of x satisfy this thing. Um, then we end up with this. Um, so this is, this is to make exponents not ambiguous. So, uh, for any s in a and a z in a star, we define z bar s as being uh, e uh, exp of s log z. Um, and then we can say um, um, where log is some function satisfying um, exp log x equals x for any x in domain. Actually, yeah. Um, this is 
less ambiguous. Actually, we can say uh, in the case S is an integer. Um, this selection is unambiguous. And as in the previous theorem, actually, you can say this function as in the previous theorem, unambiguous and agrees with our prior exponent notation as in the previous theorem. The other cases are left ambiguous dependent on which values are given to the log function. Unless otherwise stated, however, we will assume the uh, selection of log equals principal log So this lets us define exponents. Um, so we, we have left it ambiguous up to a determination of what this log function means. Um, but this definition of exponents, so as per this theorem, this theorem is saying no matter what uh, branch we pick, so no matter what value we pick, uh, we're always going to have e, uh, uh, exp of n times, this should be lowercase log exp of n times log of x. Um, if for an integer, this is just x power n. This will be true uh, regardless of x, so long as n is an integer. Um, in the other cases, we're just going to leave it ambiguous, but if we don't specify, we'll assume the principal branch, which is this one. So the, the principal branch is um, we have an uh, analytic on the connected domain where we just exclude the negative axis, the negative real axis, and also have the value that the log of 1 is 0. Um, so um, so this, is, this is sort of what we'll use. Um, and so we have a theorem about this. Um, actually, we'll, we'll, um, we'll have to define something first. So... Um, just like um, just like all of our other functions, we can extend the binomial coefficients uh, to um, arbitrary values for any s in a and uh, n in uh, naturals including zero we define the binomial coefficient s choose n as follows so this is going to be our definition. And we'll have to, um, I have a specific definition for this. Um, I 
think we can do um, probably works best if we do i equals uh, 0 to, one, to n or sorry i equals 1 to n we have i in the bottom and I think it's s minus i in the top or something like that uh, we don't want to use i let's use j we also did that up here didn't we This is very particular. Okay, it's actually S plus one minus J, minus J. S plus one minus J. Okay, um, so we're defining these binomial coefficients. Um, they're going to, they just sort of extend our the regular binomial coefficients. Actually, um, if you just treat, it's the same as, um, uh, you know, um, Newton does it for, I think it was Newton, uh, did, did it for, for if, if S is just any real number, you can do it. Um, and we're actually going to use them for exactly the same purpose. Um, but you can define them using this arbitrary product. It's, it's exactly the same formula. You could do it another way. You could actually do Instead of having this j in this in this bottom part you know, as a fraction, we could actually just do just one over n factorial times this product. Uh, we could also flip this product around if we want. Um, we could flip this around to um, instead of going one to n, uh, we could go. Uh, or sorry, we'll still do one to n. Let's see. Uh, when j is at its um, let me think on that. If j is 1, this is 0. And if it's n, then it's minus n minus 1. Okay, so actually we should do 0 to n minus 1. Uh, and then we can just do... That doesn't help me at all. It's basically exactly the same thing. Whatever, that's fine. Um, either of these work. Which one do you think looks better, actually? Uh, we could do it this way, or we could do it... ...this way. Uh, I kind of like the first one better. Yeah, I was thinking that as well. Okay, I'll just use this. Yeah, 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 um, yeah. Because the bottom one has the index. The index sort of like makes sense. Um, I'll use this. This I think, the top one. Um, we can always index shift if we need to in practice. Uh. I kind of like this one actually a little bit because if we think of this as a function of s, um, this is just very clearly a polynomial, like a factored polynomial, um, like it's literally just a factored polynomial, um, where the zeros are exactly the values that j takes. Um, that's kind of nice in that sense. Yeah. Uh, okay, so uh, so we'll define these like this. Um, like this. Um, uh, and we're just going to sort of leave them like that. And so we can have, we can use these in a theorem. Um, so we can say, um, okay, so for each uh, S, we can say fixed S in A using the principal, uh, principal branch, we have 
um, z power s, actually we'll use, let's do x power s. We'll also, I'll also change that up here. Choose n times x minus one to the power of n. I think this is I think this is the case. Um, and it actually just follows um, um it actually just follows, um, we just take the derivatives repeatedly, directly. Um, so we say, um, since uh, log is analytic um, at x equals one, then the function x power s, which is just exp s times log of x, is as well. Um, now we can just take the derivatives. We can re recover the um, coefficients uh, of its Taylor series in an induction. So we can just say um, uh, let's see, how do we want to do this? Oh, well, maybe we want to do that first. Um, do the derivative of logarithm is one over x. I think it's probably fine as it is. Um, or maybe I'll, I'll make a note earlier on after after I type this out. X uh, times the derivative of the inside, which is s times that, which is one over x. Okay, so So I've got this.
Now let's see. Let's rewrite this as x power minus 1. So in order of x power s is we just do this definition, do the chain rule, and then we can say, well, actually, this one is just uh, exp of negative uh, log of x. And we can pull out this s to the front. And then this is just s times the exp of, um, we have um, s minus 1 times log of x, which is s x power s minus 1. Let's see if that all fits on one line. I don't think it will. Yeah, it does not. Okay, so let's do cut it off there. I think that should be okay, maybe. Nice, okay, um, that's the power rule. That's pretty neat. <laughs> um, that's very cool. Um, <laughs> I like how this just kind of happens. Um, we just get the general power rule. Um, okay, um, so we can say, um, so we can say, okay, so um, by induction, Suppose we have um, uh, actually we can say let's do it this way. Okay, so first oh yeah, let's let's okay, we'll do it once after time. We'll do the first derivative first. Um, equals zero we have um, x uh, zero power s is exp uh, not zero should be one one power s is exp s log one which is exp s zero which is one which is also s choose zero so for any s we have d dx zero f derivative uh, I shall do one over zero factorial We'll say uh, for any s and n equals zero, we have this derivative, the nth derivative, which is actually the zeroth derivative of x power s um, equals um, equals one when x equals one. Then we can say by induction. <laughs> That's funny. Um, well, I'll tell you what. Uh, it's not Nix, because because division by zero is invalid. Uh, okay. So so for any s, we have uh, and n equals zero. This this derivative is one at the point x equals one. By induction, suppose we have. Um, uh, 
I choose zero. Suppose we have the above identity for sum uh, for all s and sum n. Actually, we'll be more explicit. Um, by induction through n, suppose the above identity holds uh, for all s and a sum n. Then, by taking the derivative again, actually, we'll do it this way. Um, what we actually want to say is I don't think it goes anymore. I think it's all, it just caps out at nine plus. Uh, and I actually have, I have nine other notifications from people who I haven't responded to in way too long. So they're not gonna be, I'm sorry. They'll just stay at nine. Um, okay, yeah, I think actually what we wanna do is we wanna do an induction through the derivatives. Um, is actually we want to do um, uh, instead of finding in, um, each different derivative inductively, we want to find the entire formula for the derivative. So if we follow the um, if we use the above formula in an induction, we quickly get. So we have d dx nth derivative of the function x power s is just, um, we have x to the power of s minus n times this product um, i equals, or, or j equals zero up to wherever you stop, n minus one, because we need n many factors of s minus j. But this is just um, x to the power of s minus n times uh, n factorial times this binomial of s choose n. That's kind of nice. Okay, so we've got the derivative. Um, So okay, and then since um, log is analog at x equals one, the function this is as well. So in general. Yeah, this derivative, blah, 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 to these derivatives, um, and reduction, and then we can say, uh, now we can find the Poe series for x power s, um, as follows. And then we just have x power s is the sum n equals zero to infinity of um, d dx n derivative. Actually, we can just omit this. Actually, we'll have to solve for that first. Okay. Um, One equals one, x equals one. We have uh, x power s. We have, actually, we'll do one power s is exp s log uh, one. Okay. Is 
Is that the water emoji? You're welcome. Okay, so we've got all the derivative functions. Um, we have um, we have the value at one, and this lets us find the Taylor series. So we just have this derivative times x minus one power n. Then this is just really simple. The n factorials cancel out, and we just get the binomial coefficient and we're done I think that is all we need actually we can we can, we can add another um, remark uh, we can say uh, since uh, log is analytic uh, so long as uh, p1 of x we can say x minus 1 as a value of p1 of x minus 1 is less than 1 likewise so is x power s so the above Toyota series must converge with a radius of at least one. Nice. So we have the Taylor series and we've also determined uh, what its radius of convergence is. And we didn't even have to do an asymptotic analysis on these on these these binomial coefficients. Um, which I think is pretty nice. Uh, it, that it was not necessary to do that analysis. Um, so that's pretty cool. Um, also, doing that analysis would probably be really hard because um, S could potentially be a very complicated sequence value um, and, and we would have to sort of do the whole shebang. Uh, but we don't have to do that. We just know um, that um, actually we can say Um, we can add this as a corollary.
Uh, oh, let me think. This should be... Players analytics from blah, blah, blah. So we should do, we should probably be specifying, um, so far I haven't tagged any of these theorems. Um, the theorem result that we are using specifically is this one. This result. <coughs> Uh, what should I call this? Um, Me, like the first time I actually reference a theorem. Um, Yes. So we're using our um, our um, our corollary. So our corollary was um, if we have a analytic function um, and we can find some contour that goes in a loop. Uh, around the center of the of its power series, um, then the Taylor series uh, for that analytic function has to converge with a radius uh, that's that's um, at least as large as this the closest point of that curve to the center point. Uh, so, for example, uh, down here we're saying. Um, Um, that that our function is analytic so long as the absolute value of p1 of x minus 1 is less than 1. Um, so Taylor series, uh, so if we choose by selecting a circle um, Yes, okay. Um, so that's nice. Um, okay. Um, so that's kind of cool. Uh, I'm not really sure what to do next, actually. Uh, we did a whole lot, and it, uh, I guess it's already been a couple hours. Um, let's see, what else are we going to do? We have a whole bunch of theorems we can still do, probably. Oh, I remember what I wanted to do next. <laughs> Gosh. Um.
Huh. I'm actually not sure how I would prove these theorems in our current framework. Um, this is really funny, actually. <laughs> um, so we have some other theorems. So okay, so the theorem that in in my previous draft, uh, in in my last draft, um, the um, The next theorems we get into is to attempt to do some inverse function theorem stuff. Um, but um, that is hard for for some some reasons. Um, I'm actually not sure how we would would prove this. Um, let me think. So one of the theorems that we that we had proven um, in in this other uh, in this in this earlier draft is that. Um, if we have, um, actually it's not even this one, is it? It's not this one. Uh, if we have a differentiable function, um, then it is, there's, uh, it's locally one-to-one -one in the sense that um, at any point, sorry, if its derivative is non-zero, uh, at any point where its derivative is non-zero, there's a neighborhood where um, the function uh, never, um, what do I want to say here? Um, there's a neighborhood where the function takes any value at most once, um, any value. So it's really easy to prove that, uh, for any point, there's a neighborhood where, uh, the function, um, uh, the function takes um, it's easy to prove that for any neighborhood uh, sorry for uh, for any point there's a neighborhood where the function doesn't take the same value as um, as as the function takes at that point uh, but that doesn't necessarily mean that different totally different points will have different the same but different value uh, so the same values as each other, but different from from whatever point you picked. Um, uh, uh, let me articulate. Let me just draw a picture in MS Paint. So okay. So what I'm trying to say is, so you've got you've got a point um, in space. Let's call this X, uh, and you have some analytic function. This is in the domain. So you have you have an analytic function, and what you want to do is what we want to do is we want to find a, a neighborhood um, of of this point X such that for any points um, y and a z in this neighborhood, uh, the values uh, f of y is and f of z are not equal. So we want to try to say um, for all x um, there is exists a neighborhood. Uh, um, oh, I don't know. Uh, so for all x, there exists a neighborhood O, um, such that uh, for all y and all z, we get this thing. Um, something like that. Um, that's kind of what we want to say. Um, I don't... So, so um, there's an easier way you can do this. There's, there's an easier version, which is, is also less descriptive. So you can instead say... Um, for every x, there exists a neighborhood O such that um, there exists a neighborhood O such that uh, for any point 
instead of saying y and z, you just say one other point y. Um, that for all points y, uh, f of y is not equal to f of x. Um, this is a lot easier to prove. Uh, if this wasn't true, um, then you can sort of find, you know, a whole bunch of points y uh, that get closer and closer to x, which are all equivalent, um, which all have this property. But then when you just calculate the derivative, you get zero. Um, so if the derivative is non-zero, this is true. Um, this is true, always. Um, but we want to prove this stronger condition, where if our function is, um, I think what we can say is, uh, if our function is, I think, continuously differentiable, maybe? Uh, but at the very least, if it's analytic. Uh, if it's analytic, then this claim should also be true, this, this whole second, this, this stronger claim. Uh, and so, of course, this, this claim implies this other claim. Um, if we just say, well, just take z to be x, like there's no restriction that z has to be different from x, it just has to be a point in this neighborhood. Um, so this is a stronger claim. Um, and I'm not sure how actually to prove it in our framework. Um, I feel like this shouldn't be too hard though. Um, like it can't be that hard, <laughs> surely. Um, one would think. Um, but it is true. Uh, and so the, so originally in, um, in my earlier draft, we used a much stronger definition for differentiability. Um, instead of having, so I talked about this previously, instead of having one fixed point for the derivative, we had two fixed points for the derivative. Um, and that's a strong, that's a much stronger condition, actually implies continuous differentiability. <laughs> that's funny. Um, yes, uh, but no, we, we do, there is, we do actually have, um, we do have a proof. Um, um, there is, there is a proof um, for this, this harder claim. Um, and the way that we did it was essentially, if we just use that stronger way up here, this stronger definition of derivative, um, this, it follows from this definition. If, if it's differentiable in this stronger sense, and also the derivative is non-zero, then it actually follows from pretty much the same proof. So for this one, um, if the derivative is non-zero, you just say, well, if you have all these values of y, just like find a sequence, right? If, if this fails, then you can do this for every neighborhood, uh, for every neighborhood of x, you can find some point y. Um, if it fails, you can find this point y, and then you can just find all these points leading up to x and take the derivative. Um, if you use the stronger condition of differentiability, right, where you have two variables now, um, if you have the stronger condition, um, then you just do the same thing, but for, for both y and z. So you say, well, if this fails, then we find this pair of these sequences um, and just take the derivative that way. Um, and, and we just take the basically the average slopes between these ordered pairs um, as both points sort of approach x or whatever, uh, whatever they're, do they're doing. Uh, and it works pretty much the same way. It's the exact same proof, except instead of just doing, so in this proof, you'd be doing, you know, for each one of these points, you'd taking you'd be taking average slopes like this, uh, and for the other one, you take average slopes like this. Um, but it's pretty much the same proof. Um, the problem is, this this is this stronger idea. I'm in the wrong thing. Uh, there we go. This stronger notion of, where is it? Somewhere. Up, 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 up. Yeah, this stronger notion of differentiability where we have two limit points or two, two, two variables that are doing the limit. Uh, we don't have that notion in our paper. Um, we could introduce it. Um, that would be one way to do that. Um, we could, that would be, it would definitely make 
a lot of proofs easier, um, I think. Um, I don't know if we're ever going to use it again, <laughs> is the problem. Um, but proving it would be as simple as, all, all you would have to do is you would just have to say, well, hey, um, we'll, just, we'll just use this concept one time in the context of power series. So if we have a function with a power series, um, then hey, it works. Um, and it does work, because actually in this original paper, I had framed everything in terms of the stronger derivative, because it, it was uh, it's way easier to prove properties when you assume a lot more. Um, so having that stronger type of derivative just made everything a lot easier. Um, yeah, um, so in this paper we actually prove, we prove that that condition about um, power series, that in fact when we prove they are differentiable, we, we do it using this method. Um, and it's, it's a really similar proof. Uh, it's essentially just, um, we have, um, you know, um, we just do this, do this difference and then we track them out and then we end up with, uh, this sort of structure. This was kind of the same thing we had back when we did our proof, uh, except instead of B, uh, we just had X, which is the point that we're taking the derivative, the derivative at, but here, we, instead of x, we have we also have b, and it's sort of in both places. So it's the same process, the same requirement. It was we still have to prove that this remainder goes to zero in order to prove that this higher, this stronger sort of derivative still works. Um, um, but I I really don't want to prove this whole theorem again. <laughs> um, I don't want to do that. So I'm not sure. Um, I guess I'm not sure, maybe there's an easier way to prove that stronger differentiability condition. Um, like maybe, um, oh, I don't know. Uh, maybe it follows from continuous differentiability or something. Um, like, oh, if we have continuous differentiability, then there has to be a neighborhood where points aren't the same uh, or something. Um, I don't know how we would do that. Um, we could also try, um, it might be easier from power series, like maybe there's some way to, with our new tools, maybe there's some other way to analyze this rather than going through all the, all this junk, um, all the analysis junk. Um, But I really don't, I really don't know. Um, I really have no idea how we could do that. Um, I don't know. Or maybe there's another way. Uh, maybe there's some other method to prove that this other result we want to try to prove um, we just want to prove that there's, there's a neighborhood whether, where they're, um, locally one-to-one, -one. um, where there's a neighborhood where, where the function is, uh, so at each point there's a neighborhood where the function is, is one-to-one. -one. Um, I'm not sure, though, I'm really not sure, um, I really don't know. Um, gosh, these results are so crazy. Um, yeah. We could try, um, let's see. At some point we do have an open mapping theorem. I think, um, oh gosh.
Oh yeah, I remember these proofs now. Gosh, these were wild. I I basically just uh, <laughs> this proof is so funny. <laughs> I remember this. This was really funny. Um, I basically just forced the inverse into existence. I, I practically proved its existence constructively. Um, <laughs> <laughs> which I think it's just the funniest thing I don't know why I did it this way I guess I just couldn't figure it out how to do it any other way um, how to figure out how to prove it was an open mapping um, which is, is really funny to me I guess um, that in proving it's an open mapping I essentially just I essentially just constructed an, an inverse function and showed that it was continuous. Um, <laughs> it's such a dumb theorem. <laughs> okay, um, I will, I will think about this one. Um, I will think about this one. But we've we've already done. I think we've already done kind of a lot. Um, today we got a whole bunch of extra supporting results about um, about complex analytic functions and and how to use identity theorem on them um, we have we have some nice stuff here around um, anyway um, yes so I think um, I think we will um, probably cut it there for today um, yeah, we've, we've written about a couple of pages. That's kind of nice. Um, I think we'll, I think we'll cut it there for today. I'll, I'll look at more at these other proofs and see if, see if I can, I have some spark of inspiration, which, which comes up with a proof that's less dumb, um, than the one that I had used originally. Um, uh, but I have no idea if, if, if such a proof exists. Um, there's a lot of things, um, there's a lot of things that don't uh, work. Um, part of the so one of the hard parts of um, one of the hard parts of, of importing all of these proofs. So so something um, something you'll notice is that we don't have a distance function that we actually use, um, and so there's a lot of proofs that involve the. Um, Whenever we're doing, you know, sort of uh, analysis techniques, um, we use. Let's see, we did it up here somewhere, I think. Um, I guess we did not. Well, anyway, yeah. So we do a lot of, of analysis techniques, like like using this a function, uh, a whole lot. Like we bounded this integral to show this converges. Um, so we use the a function a lot. Um, the problem is, uh, if we have convergence, um, our topology is not compactly generated. So uh, what that means is, um, compactly generated a topology means that um, there is a neighborhood basis of compact sets. Um, to put that more plainly, uh, a compact set is, uh, well, I guess we know what a compact set is. Um, for us, a compact set is a set which is closed and bounded. Um, that's also the case in any Euclidean space, although we have changed the definition of bounded a little bit uh, to make the same language work. Um, in Euclidean spaces, it's possible to have a compactly generated topology uh, since every every point has uh, for any for any neighborhood of any point, there's uh, a subset neighborhood, an intermediary neighborhood. So um, let's bust out MS Paint again because we all love that. Um, so the uh, compactly generated essentially says that for any point uh, in the space, when we like we like big, for any point in the space, uh, and for any neighborhood uh, n, there's an intermediary neighborhood. Which is compact. See, um, so for all x and for all n neighborhood, there's this intermediary neighborhood C, which is compact. 
Um, that's what it means to be compactly generated. Um, this, um, yes, I love MS Paint. Um, so, so this is really nice uh, for a lot of reasons, especially in a metric space. Um, what you can do essentially is you can say, well, uh, you know, say we have some like uh, some continuity property, like this thing is continuous. Uh, but if it's continuous, that means that you know for um, for any you know uh, we can we can find you know uh, for any like positive bound, we can find some neighborhood where the distance of of our function f we can find some neighborhood where this distance this distance um is this distance d is uh to any point uh, on the image of the function is sort of small so you know f of y minus f of x um this distance is small um so you want to find some bound on this um i don't know whatever something like you know this something to this effect you'll see this a lot in analysis um just i mean it's basically an epsilon delta definition of continuity um so here's the problem um this doesn't exist in our space all like this entire idea is just gone uh, it just doesn't work um it, it's um there's uh the the essential problem is that our compact sets are all bounded but our open sets are all unbounded. <laughs> so, so there's no open conf uh, compact set. Not only is our set, our, our, our topology not compactly generated, um, but in addition to not being compactly generated, it doesn't even have compact open sets at all. None of the compact sets are open. Um, so, th so there's no way to do this logic. It just doesn't, it just doesn't work. Um, any bound, even using our A function, any bound you pick will be violated in a neighborhood, uh, somewhere in a neighborhood, because um, every neighborhood is unbounded. Um, so we just can't do this, uh, any of any of these techniques. We can't say, you know, hey, let's let's have this go to this point, and then we can say, well, let, now we can just find, you know, the bound. Um, we get around that a lot. The way that we get around that is um we'll say instead of saying uh, you know since f is continuous we can find this neighborhood of x instead we'll say since f is continuous um then for every uh sequence of points that's approaching x we'll do it like this then uh in this case we can now find um we can now find a compact set that bounds these points um, but we have to pick a sequence first, <laughs> so we can't we can't leave it arbitrary. We have to say, uh, pick a sequence and then find a compact set. But it won't it won't even technically be a, a neighborhood. Um, you could say it's a relative neighborhood, but that doesn't really mean anything. Um, in in the case that it's a relative neighborhood of the seat of the set that's just the sequence with its limit, um, it doesn't really doesn't really have any value. Um, but you can do it if you have if you have a sequence. If you pick a sequence first, then you can find a compact set that bounds it, and then we can find, you know, we can find our r. Uh, we can find some r uh, using the a function. It wouldn't be a real number, but we can use the a function to find this bound r on whatever we want to do, because uh, the continuous image of a compact set is compact, and the compact sets in our set are all bounded. Um, so we can sort of exploit that. Um, so it's really finicky. There's a lot of proofs in analysis that don't work um, because because we don't have this compactly generated set. So we don't have this. Um, we don't have these. You know, if it's continuous, then we can find a neighborhood, which so on and so forth. Um, but we can do it if we pick a sequence first. It's really weird. Um, it's really strange. Anyway, yes. So I'm I'm gonna um, I'm gonna kind of show it there though. Um, I will attempt to find um, a, a less a less sort of brute force technique um, to do these theorems that we have looking forward. Um, but essentially, just to sort of give a summary, um, we're going to, what we're going to attempt to do next is we're going to try to prove that our analytic functions uh, are open maps so long as um, 
their derivative is non-zero. Actually, it's their derivative has to be a unit. Um, if their derivative is a unit, then we'll then we will show that that uh, an analytic function is an open map. Uh, and in case uh, you're not sure what an open mapping is, um, to give sort of a recap on um, what um, sort of the basics of topology are, uh, a function is called continuous when the pre-image of an open set is an open set. A function is called an open mapping when the image of an open set is an open set. Um, so it's sort of the paired condition to, um, to um, continuous. Um, in fact, if a function is an open map and has an inverse function, um, then its inverse function is continuous. Um, so in order, so the open open mapping theorem, yeah, words. Um, so the open mapping theorem uh, is essentially is going to say if we have an, an inverse function, then it's continuous, and that's kind of really important for us. Yeah. Um, but that's sort of that's sort of where we're looking at next is we're going to attempt to do the open mapping theorem, and we're going to attempt to do the inverse function theorem. Um, that's what we have in store. Um, Yes, that's what we have in store. Um, but for now, I will I will cut us off for today. Uh, we got a lot done. Uh, we had a lot of fun. I had a lot of fun today, actually. Uh, I had quite a lot of fun. Um, but thank you so much for coming. Uh, if you have any questions, ask them now. <laughs> Although, of course, you can always ask questions in the middle anytime you want. Um, but if you have any questions about any of these, or if, or if there's something else you'd like me to talk about a little more before we we leave. Uh, another working out over the weekend. Would you like me to do one over the weekend? Um, I could probably do one over the weekend. Um, I've, I've been leaving the weekends open uh, just because I, I don't, uh, I guess, there's not really a reason to be honest, actually. <laughs> um, we could do one over the weekend. Uh, yeah, we definitely could. Uh, yeah, I guess I'm asking, do you want to? Isn't that's my question? Because um, if you want to, then yeah, I guess so. We could do that. The same. Yeah. Yeah, mostly I've just been, I've just been leaving them, them open just because, um, uh, I figure, I don't know, it's nice to have, uh, I guess just like a couple days. Uh, I mean, I really like doing math a whole lot. Um, uh, but it's just important to, like, take a day to make sure I'm, like, taking care of myself, you know? Um, because otherwise I forget. <laughs> like, I don't things yeah yeah pretty much weekends are lazy days I'm just normalizing that that notion it's pretty much the only reason um, well we'll see if if I um, I'll be I'll be looking at these other theorems that we want to try to prove um, if I figure them out then then I will do a stream uh, how about that if I figure them out then I'll do a stream um, but no promises so we'll, we'll see yeah. Okay. Um, well, if that's if that is all the questions, then I think we'll be uh, well. Class is dismissed. <laughs> Thank you and goodbye. Have a nice rest of your day.